And welcome back to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin in our studio in Moscow, Idaho. I'm speaking with Jack Fenza. He's uh, the empresario of all things uh, performing arts on public television, having created, among other things, great performances live from Lincoln Center, Dance in America, and American Playhouse. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thanks for staying for a couple extra minutes to talk with me in this Web Extra. We were talking in the program earlier about the phenomenon of now people streaming media. And I wonder, how is this affecting, say, revenue? You know, people aren't buying the DVDs any, as much anymore. They want that instantaneous ability to watch something on their computer. Is it taking away I'll, from... Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what the con with concern is. Um, I, I was reading last week in the New York Times, which I can't live without, even though I'm in Florida during, during the winter. And in the art section, there were three different ways media was affecting. One was a performance at the Museum of Modern Art, where the visual artist and the music artist had collaborated on the piece that was there. So that the, so the visual part of it was as much an, an innovation as the music. Then there was a piece on museums now streaming access to their, their paintings and their things. Then there was an alarming artist article to me about a congressional move which disallowed publishers to determine the price of their publishing that the people who were going to stream it to them would choose the price, which meant that, once again, the media was between choosing what the audiences are going to get. That's why networking was not a good place to enjoy the arts. It didn't, it didn't stream the rating they want. So I'm afraid for young people today, they will only see things that have been allowed to come to them and they have to make sure that they don't rely on all their experience to be just what's streamed to them. Do you worry, though, that uh, programs like Great Performances won't be able to sell as many DVDs because people will want to watch? Everyone wants it for free now. What I'm hoping is that if you do a fully realized program in the style of Great Performances or American Masters, those beautiful documentaries, that someone seeing a clip stream thing will use their same streaming to find out where that other program is. I was talking last night to some of the young gals in the dance department, and I was surprised at some of the things. I said, what do you watch? How do, how do you stream to see dance that's certainly not available in Idaho? And one of them said, oh, I went Michael Winton. And I said, how do you know about him? And she said, oh, he did that wonderful Swan Lake with men. I said, I said oh, if I had not made that program for great performances, you wouldn't have seen it when you were streaming it. So that's the problem. Unless we, we have some high quality things created, there's going to be nothing of high quality streamed. I wanted to ask you, and I didn't get a chance in the main program, about the massive technical issues that you must have had recording, you know, whether it's an opera or uh, a drama. I mean, you, again, you're creating this from whole cloth in some instances, figuring out camera angles. What do you remember some of the greatest technical challenges that you that you had? One of the biggest ones was that we wanted now to present art fully. And we'll take opera for example, or in dance where we could move dance very often to a studio to do it. There were big productions like Nutcracker, which were too costly, but we wanted to go into the theater. And we it was a Ford Foundation again that put some money together in the early years of public television to experiment. The idea would be no one would be paid for these things which would never be allowed to be broadcast and they would go in and see with the quality of the cameras at that day and age and the, how much lighting which had to see whether technically the audio was acceptable for opera, whether the, the video was acceptable and after the tests they then sat with the art directors of each of those companies, a ballet company uh, and the Metropolitan Opera and New York City Ballet. And they said, okay, these are the compromises we need. The opera was the toughest because they felt you had to add too much light and we were ruining the, the mood of the thing. But little by little, people edged. I remember going to New York City Ballet where I sat live while we were doing it with the head of lighting and I said, a little more light in the background. 
And while we were on the air, she kept saying, okay, they told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it. And she kept edging up and up and up. And at the end of it, she said, no one noticed. But we actually did make it. And that's how we were, were doing those first things. But that was big. Because if, you do, if, if the recording from an opera was just mics hung distant away, where you were getting the mix as opposed to in the studio where everyone is mic'd there, if it was acceptable in this test, if it had not, we would never have gone to the next stage, which is to bring people full realized performances. And directing these uh, must have been extraordinarily difficult too, following scores. There were only one. There were only one or two people who had done it, and and uh, there was this angelic person, Kirk Browning, who had started as a musician, who was one of the few people at that point who could who could record a symphony by the score because there was no real rehearsal. And that was one of the things people don't think and about. You had to know when a certain uh, No, we developed a whole, a, whole, a whole different technique. We, with the unions, we asked them if they would let us go in with one camera and just shoot the, the ballet or whatever it was. Or the opera. Then they could meet days before each cameraman and the director would say, now I'm going to cut here to you over here. This is your placement in the place. And they, so they got a cut sheet, but they were, they were learning it from just running this tape. But if they had not let us take the cameras in, there would be no way to do it because the, the unions wanted to be paid each time the cameras were there. But that was a whole new technique of how to do it. Uh, who are some of the people that, that you miss, that you worked with, that, that were just icons? Who stands out to you? So some of the well, your, your favorite performers. I, and it was it was very very interesting because I'm going to name obvious ones in those early years, but because there were people like um, like Balanchine was so much a an entity yeah. <laughs> who everyone respected as the ultimate, and once he was re relaxed with us, he would say. You know, now next time I, I, didn't, I said, are we going to do another balancing program? And I said, well, that's what he said. Are you going to turn balancing now? He said, at his age. And before I knew it, I had the geniuses calling and telling me about their next problem. But that meant that the first time round was important. But it also meant I had to really talk to Edward Albee, who was you know, already having problems with his so things right. not being success on Broadway. And saying, Edward, would like what would you want to do? I remember a hideous lunch with Tennessee Williams, <laughs> where I wanted to do something called Excentricity of a Nightingale. He wanted to do a play that I hated, and the agent said, "Oh, we'll have the lunch, and he'll think we're doing about the other thing." And and sort of halfway through the lunch, he said, "Bill, this guy doesn't want to do this play at all. Why did I even come here?" You just tell him, give him what he wants. He seems to be clear. And, and I thought to myself, this is the worst disaster, this lunch. But I did get my play, yeah. and I did not do the terrible play that he wanted to do. So sometimes you still have to hold your own without in any way insulting them. You simply have to say, for us, this would be the best thing for you. And and I've been through that with Edward Albee, with, with Nerev, when... We, we, we finally lured these people to public television. What was important is they had all seen in their genre something they liked and respected. Was it important for you to do things that were provocative rather than mainstream when you chose programs or somehow cutting edge or different? Not, not necessarily because you've got to remember the landmark achievers in the arts like Martha Graham were really at the end of their careers and they were a foundation that I thought we needed. I mean, when we went to to public theater, they were they were the ones who who took the idea that everyone deserves Shakespeare. Well, they were free in the park, so they were already focused on an area. And I thought, I think it's important that we don't have Shakespeare only with these English things we're going to import from England. I want to make sure that we realize that the classics can be done beautifully by us, and. That's why the nonprofit theaters were wonderful because they were doing Chekhov and O'Neill and those things that I would never have been able to start from scratch. And, and that's the point, isn't it? You weren't just focused on New York. 
I mean, you were no. looking for regional theater no, as well. No. And I think we did restoration theater for Minneapolis because the Guthrie was a beautiful mm -hmm. regional and you theater. Filmed at the Grand Old Opry. <laughs> so. Well, not only that, the um, the for instance, San Francisco Ballet was a wonderful ballet, and there again. You could, with, with the National Endowment of the Arts, they would say, who are the people that you all are, are funding? And I thought, well, if I trace that fund, where did it go? And that meant there was already some sensibility. And I went to many places in this country, to towns, I'll use Minneapolis as the case, where there were towns I never had on my agenda that I wanted to go to. That includes Moscow, did I ever think I wanted to come to, to Moscow? But there was a reason to go. And the reason was wonderful because I got off the plane. The people that met me were the, the head of the ballet or the opera or the thing, and they would have been the people I want to meet in that town. So I enjoyed that part of my job. When you look at the landscape, uh, let's just say cable television, do you think that uh, channels like Bravo or A&E cut into uh, the PBS artistic or the audience for the artistic programming, no, or was I, that still such a narrow I th I casting? Th I think it differently. I think because they were not as wedded to um, to the network ratings. They they took a cue from what happened in public television. They had to, if you're expecting people to pay for cable, it had to be unique. So the artistic quality of, of even something like The Sopranos, the quality of the writing, the quality of, of acting was way above what you used to have in commercial television. And what do you think about this phenomenon, rather interesting, of people going to movie theaters now to see the Met broadcast? I think it's fantastic. Live. I think it's, I have a friend who's very, who, who at one point, he was a, a very successful businessman who at one point was such an opera fanatic. He was on the chairman of the board of the Metropolitan Opera, and he was fussing about all some of these <laughs> new operas. And he went the other day and he said, I really, um, I really th th got that opera that did, it was a sort of 18th century collage of, of, of music that they did for the great, great divas. But he said, because out here our local theater did it, I saw it again on camera. And he said, you know, I liked it more on camera. And I thought, wow, that's important. And you were the, I believe, you were the one who pioneered the use of the subtitles in live Absolutely. performances and operas, which, thank you for me. <laughs> I will tell you uh, I know some people probably thought it was gauche when it first started, but it's so helpful to those of us who don't. No, what happened is I was, I was very dogged. If we're, if we're not going to do opera now and we want to get to an audience, we're not, we must, we don't want to ju just preach to the, that we, and I said, well, they said, what are you talking about, Jack? I said, well, first of all, there's a program with a storyline. We have to do something about that. We've got to tell them who the characters are, what's expected. And it was really in one of those meetings where I said, what about, you know, we, we, we couldn't get real movies from Hollywood, but we could get some foreign films. We remember we did a couple of foreign mm -hmm. films with a subtitle. Could we subtitle? And everyone said, oh, they're oh. all going to hate it. And the people who really loved it were the opera people. Oh, interesting. The opera people said, oh, this was so <laughs> wonderful. We could, instead of having it translated in English, we had the musicality of the music, and for once I knew what that aria was about. And, if you, and we actually influenced the, the opera, and that's the reason that New York City Opera was the first one to, to put surtitling in the theaters. Th these are never fair questions to ask, but when you look at your body of work, um, what do you think will stand for Jack Venza, for your legacy? Is it the dance programming? Or is it the whole I th archival? I, th I think the reason dance might stand out in a different way is that the, the lifespan of, of many dancers has a shorter time in their virtuosity. And that's true also of the opera productions, is we were able to on one side, do the artists like Baryshnikov and, and, and those people, or the dancers of Martha Graham who danced like Martha Graham because she was in the studio and said, this is exact. So those are going to be very historically important to people in looking at the archive of dance. And on the other side, there are uh, things like 
Uncommon Women Who Won Joasstein's first play that we did, which will begin to be interesting when people go back and realize that, that this was the production with the first ideal cast. And I think there would be a lot of interest in some of the historic things that were done. So that's what you're proud of as well. Down, down the line. For one thing, too, there's another aspect of it. In, in the documentaries about the arts that we did, where the Civil Wars was very successful for Rick Burns, but everyone who talked about it was someone who was a historian. If you look at most of the American masters, if the artist is not alive, his wife or his son or his partner or someone, it's much more first person. And those are going to be very historically important because you'll be able to go back to someone who did first person about yes. Judy Garland or Andy Warhol or someone like that. And so those are a very important historical body of, of documentaries. And you're spending your time painting now, I understand? Yes, it's very simple. So I said, what are you going to do afterwards? I said, well, I'm doing a painting It's sort of this big, and uh, I can work on this project without having to negotiate with the artist and his agent, and I don't have to do any fundraising. So it's a, any attractive area of the arts for me to, <laughs> to work right now. Well, the word audacious has been used to describe you. I think it's a compliment. I hope you agree with that. You, you, oh, yes, you, we had to be. You had to be audacious. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, you're 85 years young as we speak, and uh, I know you'll have many more years of contributions to the arts in America. Thanks so much for what you already have done for the, wor the body of work, the archive, the history, and the pleasure that it's brought so many people around the world. Thank you so much. And you never know where you have a new experience with the arts. I came to, to Moscow and just had a, have had a wonderful two days seeing what a whole new generation of people in these arts things are thinking and doing. So it's very enervating. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a Dialogue Web Extra with Jack Fenza. He is the founder of, among other programs, Great Performances, American Playhouse, American Masters, Dance in America, and what else have I forgotten? Oh, I don't know, the, the history of the Broadway musical? The history of the Broadway yeah. musical. We could go on and on. <laughs> yeah. Check out our website to learn more about Jack Venza and arts programming on public television. I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in.